come and worship the holy God. Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday, August 10th Bible study of the University Church of Christ in Cleveland, Ohio. I am Terrence R. McLean, ministering evangelist, and on behalf of my uh, beloved wife, Sister Linda McLean, on behalf of the elders and uh, their wives and families, on behalf of the deacons, our elders, Brother Frank Barnes, Brother Donald Nelson, Brother Greg Shields, and their families, uh, Brother Freddie Gibson, and Brother Anthony Slade, our deacons and their families. And on behalf of all of the wonderful members of the University Church of Christ, uh, we thank those of you who have tuned in to this Bible study, whether you're live on Facebook on August 10th or you're watching it later on Facebook or you're watching it later after it is uploaded to YouTube or you are on the teleconference call. Thank you for joining us, and especially, of course, if you're a member of the University Church of Christ family. Uh, before we begin our study on this evening, some announcements and prayer requests. On this coming Sunday, August 14th, we will have a congregational meeting following our morning worship assembly. And we look forward to all members of University Church of Christ being present. On next Tuesday, August 16th, there will be our monthly food giveaway from 10 a.m. until 12 o'clock noon. We want to continue to pray for the health of Sister Nicole Bird. She is still in the hospital and prayerfully will be released either tomorrow or Friday. Uh, Brother Wayne Brown, who also is still hospitalized and uh, will then be going to rehab. Sister Patricia Gaines, Brother Sanford Davis. Uh, Brother Ray and Sister Linda Knight, uh, Brother Bentley's nephew Keith, as well as Brother Bentley as he continues to mend, uh, Brother George McCall, uh, Sister Denise Draper's father, Mr. Lacey, Sister Marilyn Stewart, Sister Mildred Brown, Brother Curtis Jones, Sister Emma Brown, Sister Jill King, uh, Brenda Cohen, uh, a relative of Sharice Thomas, who is the communications media specialist slash secretary, and her fiance, Anthony Thomas. Uh, also, we want to remember Demario Brown and Talis Mora. All of these are health concerns. Uh, we want to pray for Sister Annie Morell, uh, Brother Darius Babbitt, Sister Yvette Bizel. Also, we want to pray for traveling grace for Brother Bruce Johnson and his family. Uh, continue to pray for those who requested prayer for their health and those who will have medical procedures. Uh, we certainly want to continue to pray for those who have lost loved ones, family members uh, of our congregation, but throughout this great brotherhood of ours, uh, of course, uh, you've heard me announce on a couple of occasions now the passing of Brother Joseph H. Brown, longtime ministering evangelist to this, um, the Church of Christ in Richmond, uh, Virginia. Uh, we're just praying for his widow as well as his sons and for this brotherhood of ours. Brother Joseph Brown was an excellent gospel preacher and a dear friend of, of mine. So let's continue to keep that congregation in, in prayer. Uh, let's remember the Woodlawn Church in Valdosta. Uh, they had um, Brother Sermons, Jacory Sermons, who was the administrative assistant to Brother Leroy Butler, who is one of the elders and the ministering evangelist, longtime evangelist there. Uh, and want to keep the Sermons family as well as the Woodland Forest Church uh, in our prayers. Uh, we also want to, to remember our Brother Jeff Sherman uh, and his mother and father-in-law and their family. Uh, his beloved wife, Charmika, uh, 33 years old, uh, 
died in an automobile accident on early Monday morning in Mansfield, Ohio. Uh, so we want to continue to keep them in our prayers, as well as uh, Brian Hall, uh, 37-year-old from Wakeman, Ohio, who was also killed in that two-car head-on collision. And we want to keep his family in, in prayer. Uh, remember to pray for all of our sick and shut-in brothers and sisters, their families, all those administering to the health and, and care of our loved ones. Uh, we want to pray for the Church of Christ family as a whole, its ministries, our spiritual strength in the Lord, as he continues to use us, his body, to advance his kingdom. And, of course, we are asking for continued prayer for our leadership here at the University Church of Christ, uh, the elders and uh, their families, and myself as the ministering evangelist, and my family and our deacons and their family. But we also want to pray for the body of Christ, the world, the world over. Uh, in the greater Cleveland area, in northeast Ohio, in the state of Ohio, in this country and around the world, we stand in need of God's blessing upon our lives. So if you would, would you bow with me as we go to God in, in prayer? Gracious and eternal Father who art in heaven, you are holy, you are righteous, and you are just. It is in you that we move and we live and we have our very being. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for this, another opportunity to come boldly before your throne of grace and find help in our time of need. So many names, so many needs, so many prayer requests. You've heard a long list of those who are in need of a healing touch from you. We ask you, O oh God, to please touch those names that I've already read and I've just thought about Sister Sharon Foster and Sister Cherie Warner and uh, the health issues they, they are battling as well. Please continue to be with those who are in need of a touch from your hand. You are the great physician. You are the great doctor who has never lost a patient. And so we just ask you in your grace and mercy to touch each and every one of those persons we've mentioned. And there are those who have other special requests in, in, in prayer. Sister Annie Morrell, Brother Darius Babbitt, Sister Yvette Bizell. We ask you to be with them and watch over them and grant them what they stand in need of. Be with uh, Brother Bruce Johnson and his family as they travel. Uh, they are taking Marcus to Cincinnati to enroll in the University of Cincinnati. Uh, give them traveling grace and bless Marcus as he begins this new leg of his journey. Be with all of our young people who are not only going off to college, but will be returning to elementary or preschool or middle school or high school. Uh, we ask you to please watch over them, protect them, uh, protect uh, those who will be teaching them and the administrators, and especially do we lift those who are part of the university church family who work in the school system, uh, that you would be with them Watch over, protect, and, and keep them in your loving care. Father, be with all of our sick and shut-in brothers and sisters and their families, those administering to their health care and their well-being. And Father, our hearts are, are grieved, uh, not only at the passing of Brother Joseph H. Brown, longtime ministering evangelist, uh, first of the Dill Avenue Church and then the Sandy Springs Church in Richmond. Uh, thank you for his many years of service, his commitment, not only to that local congregation, but to the brotherhood at large. Comfort his widow as well as his sons and the rest of the congregation there. Father, would you please, in the name of Jesus, 
be with Brother Jeff Sherman. Uh, his young wife, 33 years old, Shamika, was killed in an automobile accident on Monday morning, early Monday morning. And I know that I'm not telling you something you're not aware of. But would you comfort him and her parents and the rest of their family, uh, as well as the church they served there in Sandusky, who they grew to love and grew to love them as well. Be with the other young man, Brian Hall, his family and friends who also lost his life in that tragic accident. And Father, our prayer is that maybe even in lifting this prayer, somehow they will become aware of the people of God who are interceding on, on their behalf. Would you bless not only the University Church of Christ family, but all of the churches of Christ in the greater Cleveland area, in Northeast Ohio, in the state of Ohio, in this country and around the world. Bless her memberships as well as her leaderships. And Father, our prayer is that as you bless them, you bless us so that we can glorify you no matter what's going on in the world. That we'll lift up Jesus so that all will be drawn to him. Our prayer, O oh God, is that as we study this lesson tonight, you get the glory that Jesus will be so lifted up that everyone will be drawn to him. That saints of God, wherever they are, will be touched by this lesson and encouraged in their faith. Father, my prayer is that those who have not yet obeyed the gospel, who may hear this lesson as well as previous lessons or other lessons or even watch our services, the Holy Spirit will convict them of the need of the salvation that's in Christ and they will respond in humble obedience before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Thank you for Jesus the Christ, his life, his death on the cross for our sins. You raised him on the third day for our justification, and he ascended to heaven. He's on your right hand, even as I lift this prayer, making intercession for us. He said when he walked to this earth that if we ask anything of you in his name, that you would do it. So this prayer is not in our name, it is in his name. Please forgive us of our sins who are your children. May your word have its free course. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight, we are going to continue our study of the book of Habakkuk. We're going to be studying from the second chapter, verse 5 through verse 20. And so I'd like to read that into your hearing, and I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man. And he does not stay at home because he enlarges his desire as hell. And he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations and keeps up for himself all peoples. When not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppress you and you will become their booty? Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you. Because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house that he may set his nest on high. That he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples, and sin against your soul. 
For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, is it not of the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire, and nations weary themselves in vain? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you and utter shame will be on your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you and the plunder of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it? The molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols. Woe to him who says to wood, awake to silent stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Verse number 20 again, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. That's our subject as we study these verses. But the Lord is in his holy temple. We live with acknowledged frustrations in the limitations of human justice. In fact, right here, right now, on August 10th at 7, 18 p.m., we are wondering because of things that are happening in our country, in our political system, in that arena, even now, is there really any justice to that is fair and equitable? In 2015, Oscar Gronick was sentenced for being an accessory to murder to over 300,000 people. He was known as the bookkeeper of Auschwitz. He was intimately involved in the leadership of the genocidal machine of the Nazis. But since Gronick was so old and in such poor health, and because his case was mired in appeals, he died before ever serving a day in prison. When he died in March of 2018, many threw up their hands, frustrated with the obvious limits of human justice, groaning like so many others seemed to just get away. It was like he filibustered the justice that was due to him. The late Martin Luther King Jr. once said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Paulo Kelho in his book, The Devil and Miss Prim, said in the beginning there was only a small amount of injustice abroad in the world, but Everyone who came afterwards added their portion, always thinking it was very small and unimportant. And look where we have ended up today. Thomas Jefferson said this, when injustice becomes law, resistance becomes duty. The Bible acknowledges the limitations of human justice, but it also emphasizes the integrity and the perfection of divine justice. 
this truth serves as a bedrock for our faith as Christians, as children of God. But it can be hard. Especially when we're leaning heavenly upon what we see. In this passage, in the book of Habakkuk, God lifts Habakkuk's chin up a bit above what's right in front of him and shows him that, in fact, that he being God will deal righteously with the Babylonians. And this is the central point I want to persuade you of this evening or whenever you're watching this study, that in an unjust world, you must trust the God of justice will prevail. I want to say that again. In an unjust world, trust the God of justice will prevail. To see this, we'll look at three foundation stones that fortify your faith. First, justice delayed is not justice denied. That's number one. Number two, sin reaps what it sows. And then number three, above the chaos that we see, the Lord reigns. Number one, justice delayed is not justice denied. Number two, sin reaps what it sows. And then number three, above the chaos, the Lord reigns. Justice delayed is not justice denied. Habakkuk is wrestling through his concerns over justice. He's been experiencing a disconnect between his expectations and his experiences. In chapter 1, he rightly lamented the progress of the godless around them. But he wrongly impugned God for allowing it. God has graciously revealed his will to the prophet. In summary, he has said, Habakkuk, you need to trust me. But what's so interesting here is what God said before he said, trust me. In chapter 1, as Habakkuk is on the ropes, losing his voice, crying out to God, how long and why? God answers him not with a promise of relief, but a proclamation of sovereignty. But this declaration of sovereignty doesn't provide immediate relief for the people of Judah. What does it promise? It promises their discipline at the hands of the wicked Babylonians. So when Habakkuk throws up his hands, confused and in a crisis of faith, God says, trust me. He tells them that he and all of the faithful Jews under the old covenant and for us under the new covenant, all Christians, that we must live with enduring faith even when things are difficult and don't completely make sense. If Habakkuk is buying that, there's still a lingering question that the bold prophet doubtless would be keen to ask. What about the wicked, Lord? What's going to happen to all these wicked folk that seem to be getting away with everything? And to this, God answers in verse 6 through 20. We see the Babylonians and indeed every wicked person will receive the justice that they deserve. Justice delayed is not justice denied. And while there may be limitations to human justice, there is no limitation to God's justice. Listen, the God of all the earth will do what is right. Oftentimes people think the Bible is an archaic book that is out of touch with what dominates our progressive and what we consider sophisticated culture. There are people this evening who consider the cultural hurdles evident in today's society to be too high for them to clear. That's interesting because this evening we are 
going to cover robbery and exploitation of others and excessive cruelty, sexual assault, and the belief that you can worship however you want. The question really is, am I going to be reading from the front page of the Cleveland Plain Dealer or am I reading from the front page of the Detroit News or the Detroit Free Press? Or am I reading from the front page of USA Today? Or am I reading from the Bible? The answer is, we're actually reading from the Bible. From the ancient prophet of Judah from over two and a half thousand years ago, what he is talking about in the second chapter covers robbery, exploitation of others, excessive cruelty, sexual assault, and the belief that you can worship however you want. As we walk through these versions, I want you to keep something in mind, that people throughout history abhor all of these types of practices. There's not a question whether or not the majority of people think such injustice is wrong. No, it's what can you do about it? What we see with the God of the Bible, not only does he see it and say it's wrong, but he's actually going to do something about it. But he's going to do it on his own timing and according to his own purpose. This is why you and I must live by faith, trusting the God of justice will prevail in an unjust world. As we look at this judgment, we'll notice some repetition. There are five woes in this passage. These woes are pronouncements of judgment. And while we might not speak with the words of woe, we do know what God is saying and doing here. The woe language here is more of a mocking song that means to taunt Babylon. It is pointing out the folly, the foolishness, and the certain doom of, of the nation. Here in Habakkuk 2, it's not a hope. It's certain. The mocking chant of these five woes are the opening song, the prelude in their funeral service. Their time is up. Even while they are revving up their engines of death. Number one, verses six through eight talk about robbery. It's straightforward what they're doing here. They're taking advantage of the poor by gobbling up others' property. They would do this either by robbery or fraud. They had plundered many nations, according to verse eight. And then they take advantage of those whom they conquered by extortion. They would take a number of pledges. So the poor would need money. And then the Babylonians would take all of their stuff and give them a fraction of what they need. God is saying that there is a time when those who cause others to shake in fear will themselves tremble or shake in fear in verse 7. It's interesting here to consider this in light of all of the political discussions about social and financial inequality. There are important conversations to have. But while we may tire of the failed solutions of our system of government, it's good here to notice the motive of this judgment. It's an injustice. The acts committed by the Babylonians are unjust. Why? Because they are committed against other image bearers. It's not right to treat other people in this way. Why? Because it's an attack upon the glory of God and the dignity of man. There is a reason why we should care about those who have been financially oppressed. And it's primarily theological, not economic. God is reminding us here that while justice is delayed, it will not be denied. Babylon will pick up the check, and they won't like what's written on that check because they are robbing people. Isn't that the same thing that's going on in our country right now? What about exploitation in verses 9 through 11? 
as they heaped up their riches, they built these great compounds as testimonials to their triumph. They are likened in verse 9 to live like eagles in a nest high up and safe from others. They thought they were secure in their financial and military security. And we might likewise grit our teeth when we see those in power who seem to evade justice. Notice what I said. They seem to evade justice. People with lots of money avoid the prison they seem to deserve. Politicians leverage their influence to mitigate their crimes. People seem able to cash in their capital in order to protect themselves. But even from the place of apparent security, we see the stone crying out from the wall and beam crying out from the woodwork. Similar to the rocks in Luke's gospel calling out when there is none to stand and do the job, the inanimate objects personify their disdain for this injustice. And so, too, when we see those apparently secure, not high up in their houses, but in their high positions of, of politics, corporate America, Hollywood, or other industries, and unfortunately, I've got to add, they are seeming to be high up in the portals of, of religion. We remember they can never be out of reach of the long arm of God's justice. While justice is delayed, it will not be denied. Babylon is going to hear the doorbell ring and justice will come barging in. The third thing we read about in these verses, in particular verse 12 through 14, is cruelty. We read of the people who build towns with blood and cities with iniquity. We can't help but think of our own country. Where so many make money on vile things like sex trafficking, prostitution, child pornography, and other forms of iniquity. And then there is the building of this country on blood. How many politicians receive lucrative checks and corporations and billionaires sign big donations in order to keep the murder of children in the womb legal? Oh, I know the Supreme Court has overtained overturned Roe versus Wade and now they're saying it is not a a, 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 a federal right, uh, but states can make their own decisions about abortion. So you'll have some states that say it's okay to do it there, while there are others who are saying they're going to outlaw it. And there are some who say they're going to have the exception and those who are saying they're not going to have any exceptions at all. The abortion industry in America is a billion dollar a year industry the slaughter of children is as lucrative as it is repulsive and let us not get just caught up on this idea of abortion what about the slaughter of children and other innocent lives that have been snatched away over the past few years in schools, on college campuses, and even at parades worldwide, we know that we are far from ushering a utopia. In fact, someone has said the last century was the bloodiest in history. Despite all of the medical, technological, scientific, and military advances of the last 100 years, we have not entered a utopia. With dictators, many of them in the 20th century, Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, and Pol Pot, and those that are trying to be dictators even now in the 21st century, but those in the 20th century led to the bloodiest 
in all of human history. There are many countries that have a sad history of bloodshed. And you may be wondering what's going to happen to them. What's going to happen to the countries and the dictators now? Or even the would-be dictators. Habakkuk is learning, and we should be learning, that justice delayed is not justice denied. Dictators and oppressors, the wicked and evil alike, will stand before the judge of all the earth. And he, God, will do what is right. So we've looked at robbery and exploitation and cruelty. There's also assault in verses 15 through 17. Here we're talking about the conquest of others and then either making them drunk literally or making them drunk figuratively on wrath. Either way, the point is they will assault them by making sport of them. It is an R-rated description here that involves, in verse 15, gazing at their nakedness. And this probably involves far more than the violation of, of looking. It's an unspeakable assault. But what do we read in verse 16? There is another cup to be served. The right hand of the Lord will bring judgment upon them. If you're a child of God, you, you, you have to be disappointed and somewhat discouraged by the filth that is now commonplace on television and in movies and now in, in ads. Uh, you have to be disappointed and discouraged when, when, when you look around at people in our society and how they are dressing and and somewhere even our black women have been told that they don't have to cover themselves they they don't have to worry about having dignity and, and have a royal demeanor and so some of the things that we are seeing out in the public arena were unheard of 50 20 15 10 years ago And even though it may seem in the moment like this type of thing is lasting forever and that justice is tearing, we need to know that one day the oppressor will feel the weight of judgment. And then the fifth thing that he talks about in this chapter is verse 18 and 19. Finally, God pronounces judgment upon Babylon for their idolatry. And while Babylon was a strongly pagan nation, it was not the only one. As someone has said, God made man in his image, and man has been repaying the favor ever since. Man has all kind of idols. And at its core, idolatry is replacing the love and the devotion to the creator for a supreme love for something that he has made. It's a disordered love. It's a problem of the heart. It assesses God and says he is unworthy. To this God will judge. People today really need to take this seriously. We need to see that God does not just chalk up idolatry. To a different type of worship. It's robbing him. Of what is due. And so he will bring clear judgment. We may be tempted to look around the world. And see how people seem to be getting along well. With their persistent denial of God's worth. And they may even seem happy. While they are pursuing these gods with a little g. But we should be assured that there is a jealous God in heaven and he has a hammer that will smash all idols, whether that idol is yourself, whether that idol is education, whether that idol is money, whether that idol is a political ideology, whether it is philosophy, whether it's another human being or a group of human beings, 
God said, you shall have no other gods before me. God's a jealous God. Knowing that justice is coming brings us encouragement amid the chaos. But also it's important to be reminded that sin reaps what it what it sows. That's number two. I wonder if you notice the surprising irony of this passage. Did you see how much of the sins committed by the Babylonians seem to come right back upon their heads? It's like sin has a boomerang effect. Like it is hardwired for personal destruction. I want to highlight a few examples in this text. In verse 7, we read that the debtors will arise and become the accuser. The one who took others for spoil will themselves be taken. Why? Because in verse 8, you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of the people shall plunder you. It's like a boomerang right back upon them. Then you see in verses 15 and 16, the one who makes others drink the cup of their judgment will themselves have their mouths held open and they shall drain down the dregs. This should remind us that sin is perverse. It's a dangerous mistress involved in the dark arts in the pursuit of promised personal enjoyment and happiness, sin delivers the scourge of death and judgment. Someone has said that sin will take you further than you intend to go. And it will keep you longer than you intend to stay. And it will cost you more than you intend to pay. I want you also to understand the futility of sin. God in his judgment upon sin actually injects futility in the pursuits. It's as if God says, you don't want me, then you will get the nothing that you want. There's a built-in frustration element to all who oppose the Lord, if you look at verse 13 and 14 again. There's a frustration that builds within them as they attempt to find salvation in created things. There is a futility and emptiness. Babylon is building itself up but doing so wholly independent of God's kingdom purposes. But at the same time, at a deeper level, God is allowing them to expand for his purposes. And then in the end, they will be destroyed for their rebellion. And in spite of everything, the Lord will accomplish his mission. In Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 13, it says, Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? In spite of all of the work, the progress, accomplishments, and perceived breakthroughs, what's the point? The progress, this laboring and wearying in the end is for nothing if it's not for the Lord. The self-seeking nations are doomed to futility. All is vanity. Life is fleeting. What becomes of all people have done? It passes on to someone else. Why? Because there's no desire for the kingdom of God at its center. This is very important when we think about the geopolitics in our day. Just because a nation, any nation, may be favorable in a relative sense, it may provide nice benefits, there may appear to be order and opportunity, it does not necessarily mean that that nation is doing God's will. God makes clear that nations that do not have him at the center of the identity and existence will be toppled and it will fall. Self-seeking nations are doomed to fail. If there's no desire for the kingdom of God at its center, then they will be toppled by the jealous king. 
Now, this does not mean that God does not use nations. He does. Look at Babylon. But there's something greater going on in the back of chapter 2. And whether you know it or not, there's something greater going on in our world, in this universe, and in history right now. People should remember this when they wave their flags and they engage in political debate. Sin reaps what it sows. Paul told the Galatians, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You must see that sin reaps what it sows. And sin cannot stop God's agenda. And in a surprisingly sovereign way, God can even take sin and use it to serve his divine plan. This brings us to the final fortifying stone. Above the chaos, the Lord reigns. The Lord rules. In the midst of the futility of sin and the promise of certain judgment from God, Verse 14 says this. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea. In spite of opposition, the Lord's agenda is proceeding ahead and will accomplish its mission. There is a futility to sin. It reaps what it sows. Think back to the creation in the very beginning in the book of Genesis. God made man and woman in his image. And what did he tell them to do? To be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. In an ancient society, when a king would conquer a region, he would set up monuments or images of himself throughout the land to reflect his rule and remind the people of who he is. In a similar way, when God created people, he stamped his image upon us. And he told our first parents to multiply. Make more image bearers. And fill his earth. With his glory. But we all know that Adam and Eve sinned. And rebelled against God. And nevertheless, that does not stop God's mission. Sin does not thwart God. God sent another Adam. This one wouldn't fail. He came and lived the life that man didn't live, couldn't live, and wouldn't live. He perfectly reflected the glory of God and fulfilled his law. And finally, he died upon the cross to pay the just penalty for image bearers who have sinned and broken God's law. Then he rose from the dead on the third day, ascended to heaven, and he's on the right hand of God. When you and I hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, Believe that gospel. Repent of our sins. Confess with the mouth Jesus Christ is God's son. And I buried in water, baptized for the remission of our sins. Hence, trusting Jesus Christ through our obedience to the gospel of Christ, we become new. We began to, as Colossians chapter 3 says, be remade in the image of our Creator. Through Christ, we and the church begin to spread his glory to the nations. And now he has sent his disciples to the nations. He does so with a desire to see more and more people come to Christ. God's mission to reach the nations with the gospel through healthy churches is this unstoppable mission of filling the earth with the glory of the Lord. This knowledge here includes an acknowledgement. 
people will come to confess him. God will make Christians. God will cause people like you and me to be born again. God will do this. And God is unstoppable. We've read the end of the book. I told the church in Sunday school this past Sunday about turning to the last page. Well, tonight, or whenever you're watching this, I want to turn to almost the last pages of the book of Revelation. And in Revelation 5, verse 9 through 13, it says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you are slain, and by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing." And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Why? Habakkuk 2.14 For the earth will be filled with God's glory. All opposition will be on the trash heap of history. God will have the prime place. And the other aspect of the sovereign reign or rule of God can be found in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. We see here a contrast, but the Lord. Is contrasted to the idols. These idols that are fashioned by human hands. Even though they are worshipped by the multitudes. They cannot speak. They cannot teach. There's no life in it at all. Notice where he is. We read it. He is in his holy temple. Throughout the Bible. The temple portrays the presence of God. And the rule of God. The picture here is of God ruling over the entire world. He is sitting on his royal throne. He is the Lord God. In spite of all of the questions from Habakkuk and no doubt from all of us, we find the fact that God reigns. The Lord rules from his temple. There are a lot of question marks in chapter 1. But there's a massive exclamation point in chapter 2. The Lord reigns. You and I need to remember this. Not only when we read the newspaper. And not only when we watch MSNBC. Not only when we watch CNN. But when we lay our head down at night. Or when we get bad news in the morning. Or when our heart sinks in our chest. When things don't go as planned. When life doesn't make sense. When our question marks are piling up. Grab these three words and cling to them with all your might. The Lord reigns. I want you to also notice here that this temple is described as a holy temple. It's not a throwaway word. It's not trite. It's very important. Holiness means both morally pure and transcendent. That means it's above us. Holiness means there's no charge of impurity or imperfection. And by nature then it means that the one who is this holy is set apart and transcendent of everything else. God then is exalted. The context makes this so arresting. Remember Habakkuk in chapter 1, all of his questions. Normally the prophets prosecute the people for their unfaithfulness to the terms of the covenant. But Habakkuk is prosecuting God for his perceived unfaithfulness. 
Remember Habakkuk 1, verse 12 and 13. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you've ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? This is why this statement in chapter 2 is so important. God is saying that his work of using the wicked Babylonians to accomplish his ends is not impure. It's not evil. But even more than that, it's consistent with his holy character. It's one thing to say that God is not guilty of sin. It's quite another to say that God knows about the wickedness of the nations and even uses it, not coincidentally, but intentionally, for his most holy ends. How can God allow bad things to happen? I'm asked that question many, many times as a preacher of the gospel. Habakkuk is showing us that God not only permits them, but has sovereignly ordained them in order to accomplish his ends. The Bible, nor plain logic, would indict this as traceable to God as the source of the act, as if God were the author of sin. On the contrary, human beings are free agents who act according to their own desires. God is simply so sovereign that he can allow people to do what they want to and simultaneously accomplish his most holy, excellent, and gracious ends. We have seen this countless times in the Bible. God used Joseph's brothers to sell them into slavery in Egypt in order to save the people. They did exactly what they wanted, and it served God's ends. But it was wrong. It was sin. God uses Pharaoh in order to bring about the exile. Pharaoh did exactly what he wanted, and it served God's ends. He used the wicked Assyrians to punish his people. They did exactly what they wanted, and it served God's end. He used the Babylonians here in Habakkuk. They did exactly what they wanted, and it served God's end. And brothers and sisters and friends, he used the Romans and the Jewish religious leaders to bring about the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. They did exactly what they wanted, and it served God's ends. Jesus had to die in order for you and I to be saved, and yet God will judge them for their Sin. But God is holy and just. He sits in his holy temple. How should you and I respond to this? Sometimes we need to just be quiet. The verse says, let all the earth keep silence before him we don't like silence we like stimulation we like distraction silence is hard but here we see silence is the right response why is it the right response how so First of all, we have the hush of fear. Who can stand before this God? This God cannot be thwarted by evil. This God is going to have his way. Even the most powerful nation of any age is but a tool in his ultimate plan to accomplish his will. What can we do before him other than keep silent? He deserves quiet fear. You do know this is going to be the response on the last day. There will be no excuses or mocking or anything else that would besmudge God's name. 
Every mouth will be closed and God will be proven to be true. There will be no more question marks. Just an acknowledgement of fear before the Holy One with silence. But not only is this a hush of fear, it's also a hush of gratitude. This is for the one who has bowed the knee in faith and repentance. If you've come to the place in your life where you have seen your sin before a holy God. And seeing that he has come to unload his judgment, not upon you, but upon the head of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know that your sin has been forever cast into the sea, never to be found again. If you have come to see that all your sin has been nailed to the cross and you bear it no more, then you have a different hush. You are overwhelmed with gratitude and cannot speak. You just bask in the rays of his radiant grace and his approving love above the chaos. The Lord reigns. And for those of you who are listening to this lesson right now, I know it's tough. It's tough in our country. But you've got to remember that justice delayed is not justice denied. You've got to remember that sin reaps what it sows. Man will not get away. And you've got to believe that above all of the chaos that we are hearing, we are seeing, that is touching our lives. Above it all, God still reigns. If you're not a child of God, you need to understand that one day judgment is coming. God so loves you that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You need to hear how Jesus lived, died, and was buried and rose again the same day, on the third day, according to the scriptures. You need to believe that, because without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. In fact, Jesus said in John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And where I am, you cannot come. You need to repent, change your mind, change your will, change your actions. Acts 17 and 30, Paul said, in the times of his ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Confess with the mouth of Jesus as the Lord. Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. And then be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. It puts you into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And yes, it saves us now, 1 Peter 3, verse 21. And if you are a child of God, maybe you ought to try the hush of gratitude because the Lord still reigns. If you wandered away from him, you need to be restored in your walk with him. Contact us. We'll help you return. Those of you who need to become Christians, contact us and we'll help you in your obedience to the gospel. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our pathway. I thank you for the opportunity to teach your word. And my prayer, O oh God, is that I have handled it right. We have been reminded, Father, of just how huge our sin is. 
and reminded of the fact that our sin deserves death. But we are so thankful, so those of us who are your children, we have a hush of gratitude. Because it's at the cross, at the cross where we first saw the light. And the burdens of our sin rolled away. It was there by faith. We received our sight and now we're happy all the day. Thank you for Jesus Christ, our King, our Redeemer, our Savior, our Lord. Thank you for the salvation you've given us because we've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered us. Father, we, as the church, the people of God, trust you. Even though there are many things that are going on that are difficult to understand. Help us, O oh God, to refasten our grip of faith upon you. You've already proven yourself true and faithful in our salvation. And you have proven yourself faithful and true in the fact that you have brought us safe thus far. We pray for lost souls. Help us to reach them. Through the teaching, preaching of your word and the living of your word in our lives. Use this study even to bring them into a greater knowledge of your will. And may they respond in humble obedience before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Again, we pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Brother Joe Brown, Sister Brown, his widow and their sons and the church there that they serve. We are mindful of the Woodlawn Forest Church and to Corey Sermon's family and the people of God there. We're mindful of Brother Jeff Sherman and the passing tragically of his 33-year-old wife. Watch over and comfort them and all of us who've lost loved ones. And as we close this prayer, we pray that you would keep us safe. We realize we are not out of your presence. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, we pray and ask it all. Amen. For all of you are Christians, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. And whether you're a Christian or not, remember God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you. And I am your servant for Jesus' sake.